Welcome to the platform of water, um, right, nitrogen, right. Um, we actually have a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of the overall presentations today, but I'm sure you'll enjoy each of them. Just a quick introduction, as I said, the, uh, myself, Dave, and then our three students are just sitting amongst us. Um, we're going to um, have Danielle first, followed by um, uh, Kieran, and then and Sashi, and we'll just introduce each of them as, as they come up. Um, it's their time. Um, so I'll just present uh, quickly first, then Dave, and then we'll have a bit of a QA. and a um, Last time we actually ran out of time, so we'll, we'll try and stick to time a bit better this time. And then we'll have our emerging scientists, which is the main, main part of the day and the most important bit. Um, and then you'll cast your votes. So welcome everyone. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Marguerite White. I actually work for myself, but I work across a number of these industries. Um, dairy is my passion and love, and it's actually the one that I have um, the, uh, I guess, have had the most experience in. But I also do a lot of work in the sugar industry and cotton industry as well. Generally around soil, nutrient, irrigation um, use, and um, I'm not a researcher, so I'm a bit of an imposter here today. I know this is a research foundation, uh, research uh, conference, but uh, primarily my experience and my expertise and the area of passion that I have is in taking good research and making it hit the ground practically and effectively. So I'm a bit of a translator. That's the way I've always seen myself and they're the projects I tend to get involved in across the, the different sectors. So today I'm talking to you about one of the um, projects that I've now been involved in for the last five years. It commenced as a Smarter Irrigation for Profit project, which was a cross-sector project between cotton, um, sugar industry, rice and dairy. And the idea was, in, was to actually look at how, across the industry sectors, that we could improve irrigation efficiency to increase the profit where we actually delved into the energy use, water use, and labour use efficiency um, when it comes to irrigating farms. So on dairy, um, what we did was we actually had five optimised farms set up across the in various regions. Um, in, in New South Wales, we had two of those farms. One was in Tamworth, the second, and the second year was in the Upper Hunter. Now that was a national project. Um, Dairy Australia had some big investment in that and also the Australian government through the Rural R&D for Profit program. There were some good outcomes out of that, but as usual, what happens in a three year project, things, there's some recommendations that come out and things kind of stop, you know, they don't, kind of don't go any further. But in their wisdom, Hunter Local Land Services, um, actually through a bit of just small amount of funding to keep the project kind of ticking over in their region. To actually take those recommendations and some of the key findings and say, well, hey, let's just get it out a bit further in our region amongst our dairy community. And that's also the project that I'll be talking to you about today. That's where some of this data comes from. So overall, we've had about seven farms that we call our optimised or case study farms. And we've actually been employing really two very specific things and then measuring sort of the outcomes around that. So one is uh, use of soil moisture monitoring. And number two is um, using some sort of scheduling tool. So I'll just um, actually delve into that a little bit later. On a couple of farms, we've actually been able to do some pasture measurement around that. And some of them we haven't. We've actually just been telling some good stories. We've been actually videoing and holding podcasts with these farmers so that they can talk about how these tools are actually helping in their decision making. So you've got a handout from me in front of you. I'm just going to briefly go through some of the key findings of this and then pass over to Dave. Most importantly is the website for this project. It's full of practical resources. These are things like checklists to check your operating, your irrigation operating system and not just in overheads with you know, looking at all the variations across the New South Wales um, dairy industry. Things around, how do I make a decision on soil moisture monitoring equipment? You know, it's a bit of a minefield. Five years ago, we knew very little on it. It was expensive. These days, there's more players out there. The cost effectiveness of that, of that the cost is really greatly reduced. 
but it's still hard to make a decision because there's a few cowboys out there. We've got IT and electrical type people trying to sell equipment when they don't actually know the context in which it, this equipment's going to be used. So one of the outcomes really of the project um, overall in the last five years is we've got to upskill our agronomists better, uh, irrigation agronomists especially, in actually the equipment. So let's do things a bit the other way around. Um, and that's what we've done through the project, the Hunter Local Land Services, is actually engage a really good irrigation agronomist that has a really good understanding about trying to make the right decisions in your probes and actually the telemetry that you use. So key findings from the demonstration were really around low hanging fruit. They're not big technical stuff. We've got a lot of good research going on in irrigation at the moment, fantastic stuff around very wise and automation and variable rate application. But, but the most important stuff is the stuff that we can do almost immediately that is not costly, but has some big high impact on the profitability of how you're irrigating. So actually we found that common industry practice is to delay irrigation, to save money and labour and water. Um, but all the project participants over the last five years has found that by employing these two important tools that they've commenced irrigation three to four, four weeks earlier than they w usually would at the start of the season. So they've said, actually I'm dry at this point, I need to get going. Now we talk about an irrigation season, of course we all know there's a lot of climatic variability at the moment and that's changing a little bit. So sometimes when I say start of the season, I might actually mean we've had a good rainfall, haven't irrigated for a while and the question is when do I start up again and what's my rate and you know what's my forecasting water use going forward. So around that the most expensive water is often the water that was actually never applied. By not monitoring soil moisture early irrigators become limited by the capacity of their systems so you, you, your systems can only apply a certain amount of water at, a, at any one time. If you've allowed your soil moisture to get right down there you're then only able to actually refill to the point where your system has that capacity. Um, sometimes that might mean that you're actually irrigating for longer, which means you're irrigating then to catch up during peak period power points in time. So it becomes more costly too when you're playing that catch up game. System maintenance is a huge issue. We've seen right across the project and there's stories all around the place. Go to start up my irrigator, it's not working. Pump doesn't work. Uh, birds have chewed out the piping, these sorts of things. So lots of practical resources on that web website about just checking your system, knowing that it's ready to go. Best guess standard application rates and timing result often in overwatering or underwatering, impacting upon nutrient use efficiency and opportunities to um, maximise production. So if the water, soil moisture is not right, you're really disadvantaging yourself because you're not optimising uh, that window where uh, nitrogen application um, may be a, a beneficial as well. So the other thing is too, we need to think about the overall planning around irrigation. Often we think, we think water, that's it. We're more focused on water. We're not thinking about the overall connection to forage and fodder planning, um, your overall diet plans and also your nutrient planning. So key rules of thumb that have come out over the last few years. Monitor your soil using at depth um, soil moisture probes. If cost is an issue initially, just at least get one in the ground and you can do some self calibration. If it's in a sort of a lighter soil, sort of say, well, on my heavier soils, it actually might be looking this way at the moment. So it's just a starting point. But choose your telemetry correctly so that if you, feel you want to build up soil moisture monitoring across the farm over time, you have that flexibility. Use a weather-based monitoring system so, or a weather decision support tool. So uh, soil moisture monitoring will tell you what's going on at that point in your paddock. A more overall uh, weather-based ba uh, water balancing tool is going to give you a broader perspective across the different soil types on your farm. And actually uh, these days they have a good ability, they'll ingest um, the bomb data you can override that with your own rainfall data, but they're actually pretty much having a look at the water going in and the water being taken out based upon what you're actually growing at that given time. Um, so, and be prepared, get that system ready. Um, start up irrigation on time. So the last rainfall event <coughs> to create every opportunity to maximise plant growth 
keep soil moisture in that sweet zone. So I'm not going to go through the case studies. I got into a bit of trouble for going over time, but there is, have a read of a couple of case studies which actually talk about lost opportunities by allowing that soil moisture to deplete too low and therefore the, the opportunities in terms of maximising growth were absolutely lost. The other thing that's in the um, handout is um, when we actually look at the systems, so the actual application systems, many of them, actually 100% of them, are not operating to their actual optimal efficiency. So if we take out one thing out of that um, and just pull out pump efficiency, that is actually where the main gains are. We see most pumps are actually not operating in that sweet zone and that's where your energy costs are actually being um, being gobbled up and there's some true savings that can be made pretty damn quickly if you get that op, uh, pump operating in the right um, in that right efficiency zone. So I'm going to hand it over to Dave. Uh, we've got the moisture right. We're now ready to talk about um, nitrogen. So it's you, Dave. Thanks, Marguerite. So um, yeah. So when we talk about nitrogen, uh, nitrogen is a, a pretty tricky beast. Um, one of the reasons it stands out on its own, I suppose, is complexity is, you know, you have to have all those other things right for a start, like including the water. So um, once again, we're looking at plant growth. If you have other things that are limiting, such as your water, and there's no <laughs> point in putting nitrogen on because you're not gonna get that response. Um, the other reason it, it's a tricky beast is because it's very dynamic. It's very dynamic in our systems. It's easily lost. Um, across all agricultural industries in Australia, you guys have the hardest role because you also have these black and white things moving around which go and get it, they, they spit it back out, they're not very efficient at converting it, and they basically concentrate it, and you have this really um, patchy network of you know, excre excrement and stuff, which you know, just complicates that story to another degree. Um, so just, I suppose, I have some handouts here, I won't go through every single slide of them, but I'll just show you some of the key ones. Um, I'm gonna skip the first page. But basically, if you start looking at the second page, we get to the story, four basic rules, uh, four basic rules, but there's a lot of, that goes into them. Uh, right input, so right nitrogen input. There's different forms of nitrogen, whether it's organic or whether it's synthetic. Um, you all know about fertilizers, of course. Um, the right rate, the right time, and the right place. And if we get those basically four things together, um, and some of them are easier than others, then we should be on track to get our good nitrogen management and hopefully reduce losses um, into the environment. It's a very political issue. There's social license there for farmers. Um, what you want to absolutely avoid is the situation like the sugarcane growers um, are in at, at this stage from my home state where they've got every single legislation and environmental group breathing down their neck to get their nitrogen management right. And so that's what we want to try and avoid with the dairy and sort of try and be a bit more proactive about it. Um, there's nitrogen that runs off into the, into the waterways, there's nitrogen that goes into the groundwater. You heard some from New Zealand guys yesterday about that and that's a big issue over there. Luckily we don't have those issues in Australia. Um, but there's also nitrogen that's been produced as a greenhouse gas. So it's also very important from a climate change point of view. So there's, there's environmentally the nitrogen side of things is also very important. So getting on to the right input. So right inputs, we have synthetic fertilizer. Okay, there's different forms. Um, mostly in ryegrass, cochlear pastures are added as urea. So I'll get to the products a bit later. There's some different ones out there now, but for now we'll just stick to urea. The other important one, which is often overlooked, is what's coming from your soil. So these soils, these high carbon soils, they're under pastures for a long time. They haven't been cultivated particularly. You can have up to uh, six tonne of nitrogen floating around, you know, just in that top 30 centimetres. There's a lot of nitrogen there. Uh, unfortunately, only about four to five percent of it's actually available over one year. So a lot of it's just tied up in that organic matter, which is good. You want the organic matter there. It gives you structure, gives you water holding capacity. Um, and when that is available is often not when you want it, or um, it's very hard to predict when that nitrogen is available. So that's what we call mineralization from organic matter. Um, nitrogen from inputs such as uh, legumes are also very important. Um, there's often a trade-off, you know, if you add fertilizer to your legumes, they're not gonna fix so much because they're a bit lazy and they'll just take it from the fertilizer instead. But if you've got a nice sward of, of clover or something, you might have 250 kilograms of nitrogen going in on that. Um, looking at the mineralization, so coming back to soil organic matter, if we just flick over the page. Um, most of our nitrogen supply is gonna happen under hot 
warm conditions. So that's when our bugs are uh, releasing that nitrogen and, and the most. They're, they're pumping away, they love the warm weather. Um, they love it when your soil moisture's uh, profile's full. Um, and so that's when most of your, um, your nitrogen's gonna be released from your organic matter, which is not necessarily when you want it, but that's often why in Kaikuya, you know, you probably don't need to fertilize so much Kaikuya in the summer if it's nice and warm because you're getting a lot of that release from nitrogen um, mineralization. However, also keep in mind that, you know, moving into spring, if you have a hot period there, a wet period there, you might also get the same um, flush of mineralization, which particularly in like beef herds and stuff, if you have a dry period, then a big lot of rain, get a lot of green grass, it can also lead to issues with nitrate poisoning, things like that, which um, my colleague will cover in a second. Um, so when we talk about the nit nitrogen timing, so when do we want to apply the nitrogen? Um, so obviously we want to apply it when there's the most demand. I mean, this is pretty, pretty simple stuff, but if you actually look at, um, if you visualize that, um, we can actually calculate the nitrogen demand. So how much the nitrogen um, is actually required. You can sort of see, this sort of comes from the Northern rivers where I work a bit more, so in the warmer climes, but very similar to what we see down here, just maybe a little bit um, offset. But most of our, our production, so most of our, the, the time when our plants are the most nitrogen hungry is when that rye grass is really pumping in the spring. And so you can probably put a, bit, a little bit more nitrogen on at that stage. And blow away here or what? <laughs> okay, hold on. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll try and carry on, okay. Um, as you can see, in the summertime, it's not so important. Um, the, the demand from your, your pasture is not so high, so it drops right down in the summer, and that's because that, that nitrogen is then coming from that mineralization. So, you know, not, not warm conditions, you get a lot more coming from your mineralization. Um, it's important to, to understand the mechanisms of nitrogen loss. So there's two times, major times, your nitrogen is going to be lost. Um, the first one is from urea volatilization, which... Um, it's been, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. It's when you apply urea and it basically it comes off as gas. So you put it to the surface, uh, it doesn't get incorporated into the soil and it comes off as gas. Um, I think there's a lot of fear in the community about you know, where you put it on, you're gonna lose it all. But I just rather overstated and a lot of the, the newer research that's shown is the pathway of volatilization, which is occurs under really, really windy conditions, under really hot conditions, um, is often quite small, particularly if you're applying mainly during the ryegrass season because you don't really get those conditions. So you're looking at above um, an evapotranspiration rate of four mils a day for that to become an issue. It's certainly not today, even though it's quite windy. Um, but even under those worst case scenarios, you're looking at maybe losing 30%. So as long as you don't apply your urea during those really hot, windy days. You now, granted, they can often follow a, a water, a weather front. Um, so, you know, sometimes it is associated with rainfall. Um, but any sort of irrigation or even heavy dews can often wash that urea into the soil and it's not an issue. The other major pathway for nitrogen loss is through what we call denitrification. Uh, it's a microbial pathway. It happens when your soils are saturated. So this is where over irrigation is important. Don't over irrigate. Um, if you over irrigate, anything that's in the nitrate form in the soil will be lost. Um, the bugs can grab the oxygen from the, the nitrate better than they can get it from the atmosphere and they'll go, yup, I'll grab that one and they'll turn it into a gas. And so that's when you'll lose it as well. So under really waterlogged conditions, you lost and you lose a lot of your nitrogen as well. And you often see yellow patches in your paddocks. Um, there are some different products. So we talk about the different inputs, um, which are called enhanced efficiency fertilizers. Um, there's a lot of salesmen out there selling different fertilizer types now, you know, rather than just your ear. Um, different ones target different pathways. So it's important to understand if you think you're gonna have a nitrogen loss, if you're interested in using one of these products, it's important to understand what pathway you're targeting. For instance, the, two of the most common ones, one's called uh, green urea, the commercial name. Um, it's aimed at stopping volatilization. So that's when you actually say, so, oh, I had the contractor here, the, the weather bureau is predicting a, a week of hot and windy weather. There is a potential, on, I, I might lose some of that from that volatilization process. Then you might think about applying that one. The other one is called, well, one of the brand names, there's a few out there, um, it's a nitrification inhibitor. It stops that denitrification pathway. Um, and it's called, the instant pivot one is called Entec. Um, that's the most commonly used one. Um, and it's when you say, well, they're predicting a heap of rain. I really wanna get some nitrogen on there because I wanna make the best use of my water. 
Uh, maybe you think about using that one where you think you might have waterlogged conditions. So it's important to understand those two different uh, products for two different pathways. Um, how am I going for time, Marguerite? Oh, five more minutes, oh, heaps. Okay, cool. Um, maybe four. Maybe four, okay. <laughs> um, so other, uh, otherwise, uh, other important sources of nitrogen, of course, which are probably a little bit underutilized or under uh, recognized as well, is actually what's coming from your compost in your manure. So if you are adding compost, a lot of people just add it for the lime amelioration effect or um, to build soil structure and organic matter. But actually there's a lot of nitrogen in there as well, as long as the phosphorus and the potassium, the sulfur as well. So um, it's very important also to take into account that. Um, once again, that can contribute to quite substantial losses if you start to over apply it. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out where I'm up to now. Um, so the key question I suppose in a lot of these cases is what is the right rate then? So how much nitrogen do I actually need to apply? Um, the honest answer is it depends on your grass growth. And so if you've got conditions for really, really good grass growth, you know, you want to try and get that nitrogen on there, um, make the most of that soil moisture that's there, make the most of the irrigation and get it in there. So basically if you look at now slide 11, so I'm jumping over, over the place a bit here. Um, there's, three, there's three little graphs on there. So these are all taken from Casino up in the Northern Rivers. Um, similar sort of Kaikuya ryegrass system to this. Um, but as you can see, the amount of nitrogen that we needed to apply to get optimal growth rates or maximum growth rates um, changed greatly between seasons. And so there's, the, the short answer is there's no easy answer. Um, we can have rules of thumb and they're usually okay for each regions, but you also need to think about what time of year it is, um, what's my soil moisture like, even if you have irrigation, often it struggles to keep up with evapotranspiration. So also think about you know, uh, how, much nit how much water is actually in your soil. And this is where the irrigation scheduling particularly comes important. Because if you look at say spring 2017 there versus spring 2018, same period of time, um, we had much less response to the added nitrogen. And so that was simply because even though it was an irrigated system, it was very, very dry um, spring last year. And so even though we were irrigating, we just couldn't keep enough water up and the plants were still water limited. So just putting on the same amount of nitrogen is not gonna give you the same amount of growth. You, know, you have to take into everything into account in the balance. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so you wanna go to questions now? It was a very fast and yeah, brief sorry, <laughs> turn out. One, one thing I'll just add is one of the biggest challenges, I think, uh, well, one of the biggest <coughs> questions outstanding in this space is actually that Kaikuya ryegrass transition and how you actually handle that. Um, there's various schools of thought and none of them have been particularly proven either way or disproven. Um, certainly we know during that period that you have pretty low gro uh, growth. You know, even though you, you're, you're purposely inhibiting your kaikuya and you're trying to get these tiny little ryegrass plants to come up. So there's not a lot of growth there. So some people say, well, because we don't have much growth, um, we shouldn't put on much nitrogen. And we also know that that's when we have high losses then as well. So we actually lose a lot of nitrogen. However, you also have all this thatch that's sitting there and it's out competing the ryegrass for nitrogen. And so a lot of farmers actually think, well, if I put on fertilizer, it helps break down that thatch um, and release that nitrogen. So it gives a bit more to that, um, to the, to the small ryegrass plants because you don't want to you know, uh, encourage the competition. And so it's a really tricky balance. We don't think we've got quite right yet, but so yeah. The, the or the, that balance is, it changes even for one farm because the mm -hmm. farmer would start very early to get around the whole farm yeah. the the early one exactly the yeah so it's going to be more of a problem yeah. the earlier plantings yeah. um, once it gets too cold and the, the you know the, the cold weather starts stopping the, the right uh, kaikuya but from you know Queensland where I work all the way down to here I've heard the same issue yeah. how do you stop kaikuya <laughs> when you're trying to get that ryegrass established so that's a, a big issue and you know on one hand you want to try and encourage your growth on the other hand you want to try and get your ryegrass established so 
I'll do a quick one and I'll, I think that's a great point, my folks on the north coast on the ryegrass and computer system. Um, how significant do you think in, in the minimisation of losses the role of thatch control is and mm. suppression of criteria? Yeah. Very, very. So, I mean, for a start, utilisation is a key thing because, you know, you, you can be putting on and growing much grass if you're not going to use it, then it's just basically used. So, the problem with the mineralisation thing is it's unpredictable. So, the nitrogen release from mineralisation is unpredictable. So, uh, if you're putting it on fertiliser, at least you sort of know when it's going to be released. Um, unfortunately, most of our mineralisation is going to occur pretty much in those big wet weather events. And that's when it's also most prone to losses. Um, if you have a big, thick thatch layer, that just sucks up the nitrogen, that's immobilization, just sucks it up. And so if you don't manage that thatch, um, you know, you are building soil carbon and soil carbon's good, but once it gets above 4%, you don't, get, don't see those additional benefits, you know, like construction and stuff. So you pretty much plateau out. And so then you're just basically just storing nitrogen that'll be lost in an uncontrolled event later on. So you're better off mulching that, trying to keep that thatch layer down and trying to um, really get on top of it and stop it building up because it'll just suck up your nitrogen. Yanni, David, you've been doing a lot of work on, on with, um, with mar marking nitrogen and, and yes. when, when it's coming from and where it's going. What can you tell us about the, um, particularly from the nitrogen we pulled, actually, how much are we capturing and, yes. and at different times? And so that's actually what this slide is looking at, um, slide 19. We can actually um, use a what we call an isotopic label. Um, so it's very rare in nature. We actually label our our fertilizer and we can tr trace it through all these different pathways. Um, so what we've seen is actually when you apply fertilizer, pretty much I think only 30% of it goes straight into the plants, the other 70% will go through the soil microbe, so that soil organic matter. So that soil organic matter is really crucial. Um, most of it sort of turns over very fast, so it might be available in the next two or three months. Some of it goes into the long term stuff and will be available in December or January when you don't really want it. Um, as far as our losses goes, we also know that we're losing about 40%. Um, so we actually put it on, we go back in um, a year's time and we try and find it all again and we, there's 40% missing, so it's all gone. Um, depending on your soils, um, these soils are a bit sandier, so you might be losing some down. Uh, on the clayier ones, most of it's going to go up is that denitrification process and that occurs when it's really, really wet. Um, and we know that you know we are actually losing a lot as um, nitrogen gases, um, nitrous oxide and dinitrogen. Um, you know, dinitrogen N2 is 80% of the atmosphere, so it's, it's everywhere. Nitrous oxide is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, and it's also the largest ozone depleter. So it's a very important environmental thing. Mm. So basically in our fields, the over fertilization of nitrogen is not just you know negative Im impacts on the environment but also it could cause the accumulation of nitrates in the leaves this study basically shows that over two and a half years 50 percent from 49 to 50 percent of the time the accumulation of nitrates in the leaves was extremely high and we know that have high nitrates content in the leaves has got a, a big um, metabolic cost for the cows due to the digestion so it's not just it's not just it doesn't just poses risk for like healthy animal but also it means that the animal will use a lot of energy to digest these nitrates rather than producing milk which what we want unfortunately we are dealing with a huge amount of spatial and temporal variability in the field which however we cannot control so the best way is to manage in our favor this variability for example in this study we found out so in this in these graphs on the, the top two graph the top two maps basically shows the N2O emissions a greenhouse gas which is a synonym of system inefficiency so higher N2O it means higher losses of nitrogen that we applied as a fertilizer bottom left nitrates soil nitrogen content and bottom right soil water content the differences between paddock 1 and paddock 2 
is that one paddock was grazed uh, three days before the sampling. The second paddock was grazed 15 days after uh, grazing. So the main difference, as we can see, that areas around gateways, for example, here it is a great example. If we see that paddock, we see that, that the area surrounds the gateways, or let's say high traffic zone, will have always higher nitrogen content due to the nitrogen deposition of cows. So it is normal to think, so what can I do with that? First of all, avoid to put fertilizer in these areas. First of all, we know that uh, these areas is going to have higher compaction and therefore lower oxygen and water diffusivity, which is going to have, which of course is going to create the perfect situation for nitrogen losses and also is not going to be a nice environment for crop development. So it's pretty useless to apply nitrogen over these, let's say, over like on gateways or areas uh, or uh, areas close to gateways of course we need also to understand how we how is variable our paddock we have several tools for example remote sensing can be one tool however the accuracy of these things can be variable so my advice is to use remote sensing as tool to understand the source and the amount of variability and then use these informations to basically treat these different zones in a different manner and also probably in a different time over our grazing cycle. So to conclude, sorry, <laughs> to conclude, so areas around gateways or high traffic zone are high nitrogen hotspots. So avoid to put nitrogen or put less nitrogen that you, that you will put normally over the paddock. Indeed, the fertilizer, the fertilizer application should follow a spatial and also temporal management. So different time of the year, different rate, different place of the paddock, different place of the paddock, different rate as well. And therefore, this new technology such as, once again, remote sensing or also you know, just a simple walk or also different system. For example, there is one useful um, tool is called the CDAX. <coughs> Basically, it's just a pasture meter. Is also a source of information. So every source of information, it's useful to predict or also to understand the source and the direction of our variability. So then we can make a wise decision how to use nit nitrogen. Thank you. Okay, so now it's um, question time. Do we have any questions for Daniel? Daniel? Yeah, I'll have one. Daniel, your, your spatial variability map here with soil nitrate, what sensor were you using to develop that map? Well, uh, we didn't use sensors. We just collect the right. we just collect the sample. Of course, I mean, this is a an experimental study, yep. so. That's why we took like soil samples and we analyzed for ammonium and nitrate content. Like in these things, for example, once again, the, this particular area, like is gonna have always high nitrogen content. So you could test once, like on practical application, you could test once, <coughs> you assess the degree of variability of your paddock and then you can work to your management on this way. So. I'm uh, not confident to say that there are sensors that automatically measure this because I never tried, so I don't know. But we do like in research, we take sample and then we analyze that. Uh -huh. Gianni. Daniel, uh, if, we, if we had all the technology possible yes. to do it, do we know how much nitrogen we can save uh, by doing exactly in the best scenario possible as you suggest the distribution? and without affecting the response, right? I mean, yeah. are we talking about 10%, 20%, 50% nitrogen, well, or do we know that? Yes, well, there are, once again, you know, like, the, the range is quite wide yeah. because every situation is different. Like, you know, the right rate in this paddock here probably is not the right rate on that paddock here. Probably here, we, I can save 
like 20%, 30% of nitrogen, because it's always like from your presentation yesterday, like the nitrogen use efficiency. So we're gonna have always like the plateau of our, you know, one like our nitrogen use efficiency will reach the plateau. So it does it doesn't matter how much nitrogen I keep applying, I will reach this plateau. So where the unit of nitrogen is not gonna provide a response. But this curve, like the the angle the slope of this curve where our also like the intercept of our curve is going to be different for every different situation so clay soil will have a steeper curve in the beginning because higher nitrogen retention while sandy soil it flats down like pretty fast so that's why you know understand the source of variability so it is the soil the source of variability is is it is my management and of course we got also the, the cows so each situation is different but potentially we could say like between 30 to 40 percent of the of the nitrogen okay any more questions yeah, just wondering just how do you see this being applied back on farm well I see that. I mean, now, nowadays with these big farms, everyone has got GPS on the tractor. If you do this job, like if you understand the source, the variable, so your variability, the source of variability, especially if it's linked to the soil, is not going to change every year. So I have clay soil here. It's going to be all, let's say, in the lifetime, it's going to be like a clay soil. So once I understand, so I have a paddock. I find out that this part of the paddock is clay. So once I find out that this is my boundary, I can calculate the right amount for here. And then you just go with the tractor knowing that this is clay. So it's going to be always, of course, there is a lot of work in the beginning. But once you set up your system, it's going to be always, let's say, once again, the soil component, it can be managed. Of course, there is the weather component, which, I mean, <laughs> you know, it varies like between years. but. From the soil component, once you do, it's going to be always the same. Also, you know, the landscape position. We are uphill. I will have a nitrogen use efficiency lower, probably in like in, like, uh, let's say, pretty dry years, lower than the bottom mill due to like the water most down here. You know, all of these things. Well, Mark, was your question a bit around sort of the application of remote sensing that technologies in that the future? Yeah, that too, yeah. I suppose the explanation around the variable rate spreading is, is good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to see. Yeah, well, of yeah. yeah, well, you can use any layer of information to assess. One layer is the remote sensing. Yeah. You know, you run the drone, you run the satellite, you get the information where and by how much is variable my field. Okay, I go there, target sampling. Okay, here I find big patch of homogeneous patch. Okay, I get one sample. Soil profile, always my soil pr profile. So the remote sensing can also be used in the way that where I have to go and get the sample. Because if it's similar, if I don't have variability here, why should I take three samples here? I take just one, characterize the, the zone. Next step. Okay, thanks very much. I know that's all we've got time for. Right, guys. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm Kieran Ison. I'm go over today. I'll just do a quick background on what I am and, and what I do up in Gatton. Um, I'll go into this bit of research that we've just sort of, uh, we're halfway through at the moment, um, and then I'll go into how that's applicable at a, at a farm level and, and what you can take out of it. Uh, so a bit of brief, brief, brac brief background. Uh, we're at Gatton. We're mainly PMR research-based system. Um, and we sort of tie in quite similar to a lot of stuff that was spoken about yesterday and maximising homegrown forage and, and getting high intakes of, of those cheaper uh, forages grown at home. And obviously a PMR system that goes both ways in quality of your, of your conserved forages and then uh, maximising intake of pastures as well. And so that's what this research is, is, is about maximising intake of, of pastures. Um, we've done it on annual ryegrass, kaikuya, um, and this one specifically on lucin. Um, and we've seen almost identical responses in, in all of those trials in terms of how we maximise intake. Uh, so, as Margaret alluded to, I've got my special box here. Um, and what's in my special box is a model that we use to describe uh, the grazing pattern of cows and, and how we can use that to our advantage to maximise intake. Uh, so what we do, I'll get it out for you so you can have a look. It's, um, it's a pretty sophisticated bit of kit. 
Uh, this is a styrofoam bloody thing. Anyway, all it is is this is a model of pasture. So if you look at your sheet there, I've just got a picture of Lucen, and all it so shows is that the top layer of Lucen is obviously majority of leaf. I um, mean, the quality of that's quite high. It's got an ME and, and croup protein quite high. And then as you move down further into the stemmy part, uh, part of that pasture down lower, uh, that quality of that declines quite rapidly. And what we found is that cows will actually selectively graze the leaf uh, off the top of that pasture across the whole area of the paddock first before they actually dive down into that stemmy stuff. And so we can use that to our advantage because if you have a look at some of those numbers there, when they're taking this leaf off, they're actually taking about a thousand kilos of dry matter per hectare when they're grazing this section. Whereas when they go down into the lower sections, that bite depth actually decreases and they're only taking two, three hundred, four hundred kilos of dry matter. So there's about two to three times more utilisation in that top layer. So how do we use that to our advantage? Well, if we increase our allocations, bigger areas, we can um, ensure that cows are only grazing that leaf because they'll graze that first before they go back if we tighten those allocations up. And then we recommend that we allocate those pastures to our high producing cows to get that higher dry matter intake in. And what we found is that we got about a five kilo increase um, in dry matter compared to cows that were forced to graze down into here. So we were aiming at about 21 kilos in a couple of our trials. Uh, we got cows up to 22, 23 kilos when they were just grazing the leaf versus cows that are about 16 or 17 kilos when they were forced to graze down. Thanks. That's a bit how Queensland went last night. <laughs> um, so what does that mean at a farm level? Well, yeah, we allocate leaf to our high producing cows to maximise peak production and, and maintain a high production all the way through that lactation. And then we, we don't disregard the leftover pasture. We actually um, allocate that to lower producing cows if we've got a split herd type situation and, and they can come through and clean up the rest of that pasture or we can utilise it with secondary herds, either heifers, heifers or dry cows to maintain that production. Um, our recommendations change a little bit for grasses because when we graze that leaf, um, what we're doing is actually leaving the apical um, growth point intact. And we've actually found we get a higher growth rate and a higher pasture production per hectare if we, if we leave that intact. So we're currently working on how, how to manage that uh, and get a higher intake. But yeah, the take home message here is allocating leaf increases intake in, in PMR cows. Um, and we've developed a couple of tools to, um, to assist with allocations of those on a farm level, which you can find on the link on the bottom, bottom of that piece of paper. So thanks very much. Oh, I've had practice. We're going to be finished early this time. It's very exciting. So, um, questions, questions for Kieran? Yep. You, you just clarify, you said 22 kilos dry matter. Yep. You're talking about PMR. You know, you don't in total. Total, sorry, mate, yeah. Yeah. yeah so sorry. How much of the loosen were they eating? What was their percent, uh, or proportion of the Yep, so we, um, in this particular trial, we had two PMR allocations, so seven kilos or 14 kilos of PMR, and irrespective, didn't matter both. Cows, so we just um, that was the proportion of the diet essentially. So we just the allocation increased equally. Um, so we got 22 kilos, whether they were eating seven kilos of PMR or 14 kilos of PMR. So that total intake was the same for both. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. yep. What was the demographic of those herds eating 22 or 23 kilos at that time? Were they? Do you know what stage of lactation? Yeah, they're um, early to mid lactation, about 120, 150 days in milk. Okay. Right. Yep. Yep. Kieran, are you finding? where they're just eating the leaf. Is that a leaf? <coughs> yes. Is it pretty tidy? Yeah, it's, it's, it's surprisingly consistent, yeah. So uh, it doesn't matter, uh, the, the good part about this, it doesn't matter what stage your pasture's at, the intake's quite consistent. So if your pasture gets away on you, especially with like kike when it just gets wet and takes off, they're still removing that leaf and leaving the shit behind essentially. So we're still maintaining that diet quality and, and maximising that intake. And it is surprisingly consistent how, how they select leaf off the top. It's quite useful to try and get intake into them, yeah. Yep. You're talking about using your higher producing cows to, to graze that pasture yep. preferentially and then potentially lower producing cows getting a lower quality ration coming in after them. Yep. Do you, were, were they similar stages of lactation animals? No. Or? They were later on, yeah. So fresh and stale, but we're trying. You, you weren't necessarily just condemning the, the cows that tested poorly. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's, that's no, they Nah, they're late, later yeah. in lactation, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yep. you, you mentioned that to enlarge the area yep. to uh, that's a practical tool, but that is not always possible. So no, it's do not. You, do you actually match the, the PMR quantity? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so that's the beauty of this in a PMR system is 
is you're still um, maximizing as much pasture as you can on your platform. And then to, to maintain that, that intake, you do you can bump up your PMO if you've got it. But the other side of that, Yarni, is with uh, annual ryegrass and kike, we're actually seeing higher growth rates. So you're actually getting around quicker and your water use efficiency is actually higher because you're producing more water, uh, more, more pasture per watering. So that ties in with this quite nicely as well. Yeah. So. Okay, did you have another question? Yeah, just wondered about your management of your criteria, what, like once it started to get away, sort of, you know, spring and that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the biggest challenge, mate, is, yeah, trying to, trying to plant ryegrass back into that. We haven't got an answer for you yet. We're, we're doing a trial with that now. Um, we've looked at cutting it for hay and just taking that, that's, that sword right back to try and see how we can plant in it. We've, we've tried mulching it, but leaving that residue on top sort of limits your rye coming back up through. So we're thinking actually removing that pasture off. Um, taking it for hay or even just sending a whole bunch of cows in and just clean it up as best you can before you go in to plant your rye. But I was sort of maybe meaning more about... Oh, when you're actually grazing? You and your grazing system before you get to that point, like what point do you say pop your paddy? Yep, yep, we don't know yet, but, but we've, we've, um, we've found that oh, we've had beautiful testing grass this high, which makes you think like you got kike that high you think it's crap it is crap if you take the whole lot but when you're just taking the leaf it's just as good as if it's um, this stage and we found that um, grazing at two to three leaf stage for rye or three to four leaf stage we actually if you get on there earlier you even get a higher growth rate um, so taking at a younger leaf stage so you actually can manage the residual um, because it elongates in the stem before uh, in the leaf sorry before the stem so that residual sort of takes care of itself um, more so with uh, with kike than rye but yeah, it, it is a work in progress, but we think yeah, five kilos intake is probably worth looking into and, and trying to trying to get a better understanding for you guys. Uh, thank you to come here uh, for for this presentation and giving me a chance. So over the first uh, one year, I'm I'm here and I'm really uh, you know astonishing to see the weather. It's 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 quite a bit like my wife, you know. So every it's she's very demanding. Moody changes his mood every second. Yeah. Uh, it's this is being <laughs> don't don't published. So, so what I'm saying that is not good for the farmers. You know, the farmers doesn't like the weather change. Not my wife. The weather change. So it is a really great problem. You know, last 2018 I saw some changes, some status uh, that the the. The crop production has been really having very great loss due to the you know less rainfall and all the you know high drought seasons, and animals suffered a lot. So that's the thing you know just amused me that what should we do to change this situation because we cannot we cannot change the climate change we can we have to adapt it and we have to adapt the uh, technology to uh, adapt with the climate change. So that's why I just uh, looking for something you know new not something new something innovative which can help us to uh, solve the problem. So uh, over the first years, I, 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 it's been one year I'm doing the, my PhD and doing some work. And I'm doing, uh, taking microwaves for two reasons. But b before talking about that, I want to give you some popcorn. Uh, because uh, it is the first product when microwave was invented, it is the first product has been prepared with microwaves. Mm -hmm. And it is really, people get really amused. Popcorn. So it is really an uh, old one. So I want to uh, all of you sh please share and pass it on. Thank you. So I took uh, the two reasons is that one is uh, uh, coping out with the cl uh, climate change. And another thing is that there are a lot of possibilities of microwaves technology. Because if you all know that it's very easy, very convenient, and it is also less energy consuming. And the working procedure of microwave is totally different from the normal heating heating process. Because if you can see, if you put water uh, with it mug in the microwaves, it only heat the water first, not the, the, not the pot, not the mug. You, you can see, I think you can already observe that thing. So because it is the surface oriented uh, treatment. So that's why it heat the directly to the components which want, we want to you know, dry. So that is, that is the principle actually we're taking. So uh, it is directly, in case of forage, when I treated forage with microwaves, we, we find effect on the plant cell, in the inside the cell.
So you all know that the hay uh, and the for fodder forage is really uh, surrounded by really heavy cell wall with lignin, ce uh, cellulose, and hemicellulose, which create uh, difficulties in case of digestibility and also for the intake, animal feed uh, problem. I think I, if I give you hard corn, you don't like it. Because I give you popcorn, you enjoy it. You know, look like watching a movie, right? So, so this is the cell wall. So inside the cell, there are some nutrients available, which is really unavailable to the animals because of the cell wall. So when we start to treat it, this plant cell, uh, plant with microwaves, what happened? The, the direct surface treatment of microwaves go inside the uh, cell, and there are some bound water and some intercellular water. They got evaporated, and they create some pressure, like my wife to me, you know? <laughs> and, and it finally got popped out. The cell got ruptured, and there create some, uh, you know, lot of accessibility for the enzyme as well as for the rumen microbes to go inside the cell. So what happened when we treated the uh, forage with microwave, it get ruptured and the accessibility uh, of the nutrients got increased. And when we give it to the animals, I hope not, it's not good animals, but yeah. So when we give to the animals, it go to the rumens and what happened, the rumen microbes get more access to the, uh, inside the cell of the plants and get more accessibility to the available nutrients and they get more digestibility. So, so far I done uh, in vitro, some in vitro work uh, with some several types of forage. And I find in lucerne hay, uh, the, when we treat it for 60, 60 seconds, uh, with uh, 800 uh, kilowatt power microwaves, it shows that the uh, the digestibility increase from 60 to 70, almost almost 11 percent. So it is really promising for us to you know look upon for uh, other other situation, and we are hoping to go for animal experiment very soon, and we hope that we can uh, you know make microwave the existing situation more better with microwave and uh, microwave related technology. And it is actually not a new technology and it has been used for several industries, like uh, uh, Mercury talking about sugar industry. Uh, you know that mar microwave has been used in sugar industry to loosening the strength of sugar cane so that it can extract the juice very easy. And it shows that 18% has been reduced, the strength has been reduced up to 18%. So that the energy consumption for the uh, extracting the juice is also reduced. So that, that is the, actually the principle we are using to loosening the strength of the plant's cellular wall. So it can get more access and more digestibility will be progress. So next, hopefully we'll uh, work on the animals. And one literature review uh, shows that uh, one, my, one of my sup co-supervisor done one with uh, work with uh, microfluted forage in sheep, and he find out that 8.1 percent substantially LIBOID gain increased in case of microfluted forage uh, fed sheep rather than the uh, non-microfluted forage. So I, I think it's promising, and hopefully uh, in the next next two years uh, I have some plans to do that. I think I will find some good results and come to you again. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. The literature review, I, I, I just explained to you that my school supervisor done. He done some really very uh, short work with the economic analysis, and he found out that uh, around per ton, it was uh, the cost for oven drying or oven heat treated, it was like $1.45. And in case of microwave, it is just only $0.45 per ton. So it is really promising. And uh, we have a big microwave in our uh, uh, Duki campus. So we are doing some work and we, are, we can do like 25 kilo of hay at a time. So we also order a bigger one. And we have also in, in Crazy Week campus a microwave. So we are actually hoping to for bigger economic analysis. And hopefully maybe next year we'll find some more economical analysis and economical results with that. Uh, just wondering in terms of, oh sorry, um, time, how long does it take to treat? Is it something that you could do like on the front of the baler? Could we put it in, in stream or, or the forage harvester as the, as the feed's coming through? Actually, uh, there are two types of process. Uh, so far I, I understood from my literature that there are two types of system. One is the chamber one you were talking about. You can put that thing in the chamber like what we have, the traditional one. One is probe. 
like there are some microwave prop mm -hmm. and one of the uh, system my co-supervisor uh, invented graham roddy in uh, uni melbourne so he invented a car which can go to the land and he is using for soil uh, soil treatment for weed, weed management so he is now trying to you know, mini, uh, make something that which could be used as well as for the forage so we can at the same times we can treat it a uh, you know a large bale of hay so yeah there are a lot of processes yeah. How do you know how much microwaving to give to the material? I mean, uh, I can remember a colleague of mine tried to use microwaving for determining drum at the content of some haze, and yeah. uh, he had an unfortunate uh, <laughs> bit of an explosion uh, <laughs> and it got fired. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I just told you the uh, uh, situation is actually. Uh, it it has some uh, about it is has been used for sampling drying in case of chemical analysis, but. It, it has some problems, but the way uh, you're talking about, uh, we actually did some study, we did some trial. With Lucerne, I treat it with uh, seven times, like 20 second, 40 second, I go for, and I, I, I've been treating the uh, sample until it get burned. So I just wait to sample get burned, and I just take the maximum point. So when it is uh, treated up to 80, it's okay. But when it is go for 100 second, it get burned. So I just take the default point as a you know, burning point. Yeah. Yani? Uh, interesting. But, um, the, the contents within the cell are practically 100% digestible. So are you saying with the treatment really speeds up the access to the content within the cell? It does not change it? Yeah, uh, the thing is that uh, the, the cell, uh, as you said, is the cell, wa cell wall is cr creating some obstacle for the accessibility of the uh, enzyme. So it gets ruptured. We, we have some electronic picture of the molecular cell wall, and we find out in biochar and as well as forage, the cell, uh, the cell cellular wall has been really poor, poor, a uh, lot of pores there. A lot of pores, and uh, it, uh, according to my supervisors and all, all the discussion I have with uh, with him, and he said that that the, the the breakdown of the cell wall create a lot of accessibilities to the uh, for the nutrients and for the microbes as well as the, for the enzyme, and we find out that. Okay, a question uh, back here, and then Andrew, and then that. Just um, do you reckon that you could use that sort of process to speed up, like to reduce the moisture in forage to speed up the boiling process? Yeah. As well? uh, actually, it is really, you know, I, I am a, it's really new work. Microwave is not new, but the work I have done, it's, it's a, I have a lot, lot of struggling with my literature review because there are less literature review. And the, uh, the, youth, the, the, the point you uh, raise in, it's really, you know, it's also amused me because I asked talk with my supervisors and they said that we are still working on it and studying in this pattern. I don't know, maybe in the near future it will be uh, i i believe I, I assume like it could be like the hair processing uh, car along with microwaves it could be you know a combined process so we can maybe use and um, it, it also be, uh, and i also have a talk with the dpi they they are very worried about the heat heat create after they making the hay because there are a lot of moisture inside so it is also a problem the, due to the mallard reaction so they also thinking that it could be a possible solution but we don't know yet. Okay, last question. I'm happy to donate one to Neil if he had one. Oh, Neil, we probably reached my quota today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I was. <laughs> 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 Between oh. yourself, Michael, and Yanni, that's it. My <laughs> question then was just what you said you tried this with Lucent. Have you used it with lower quality oh. things? Yeah, yeah. I have. E.g., that rough IQ <laughs> that was. Talked I, I about have. I ha actually, I'm from Bangladesh, and uh, most of the people in Bangladesh, most of the farmers use rice straw as a main food for the cattle. So I'm hoping to go for that. So uh, pr uh, initially I work with uh, low quality canola and I still I'm working on it, the data I have, but I, I cannot uh, justify here because still I have to show it to my supervisors. <laughs> you, you, you don't know. <laughs> so yeah, but it has some promising results. Not much like that. So one thing I, I, I can share, it may have more effect on the more nutritional, uh, more qualityful thing more and a low quality thing has less effect but it has some effect okay. oh, very quick, right? very quick. Um, like with, with um, microwaving is there an optimum time with actually feeding that to the animal before you might have losses in the quality of that feed that's a good that really good question because uh, i i'm doing the the that attaching experiment with this so i am just stored the sample <coughs> for 30 days I'm gonna do analysis again. I'm gonna do for two, after one month, two months, two months, and, and for one year, I've been trying. 
but in weed control management they find that the effect of microwaves in the soil it has been uh, remained for three years so uh, after that it will getting reduced for long uh, gradually thanks Sushi. Let's all thank you, you.